Today's passage is James 1, 12 through 18. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You guys can take a seat. Thank you. All right, well, uh, if I'm all that I didn't share, my name my name's Sean, if I forgot to, to say that. So I, I'm uh, one of the elders here. I'm grateful that you're here. If we don't know each other. I'd love to get to, to meet you. So come up and say hi uh, if you could afterwards. We're in uh, the book of James over the summer. And uh, each summer is an opportunity for me to take uh, kind of some breaks. So I'll be kind of stag. Uh, staggered through the book of James. I'm teaching today and then next week, and then um, there's times where I'll kind of, another elder will come up and teach, and so we kind of share the load. Uh, we're going to do that all the way through this summer in James. So my uh, job today is to teach James chapter 1, verses 12 through 18, okay? Um, if you've never been with us before, I, I always say, you've never been with us before, we're going to do a big Bible study together, but I need to forewarn you now, going through an epistle, something like six or seven verses, is a lot different than what we've been going through in Matthew, in that uh, Matthew and Daniel are narratival. They're, they're narrative books in the Bible. And so there's room to be able to kind of go along with the story um, and not have to focus on, you know, technical things. Well, in this epistle, you're forced specifically with our passage today, we're going to be highly technical, okay? Uh, and so I, I want to warn you now, as we go through this, there's things that we need to look at in the language for us to be able to understand pieces of it, okay? So I'll do my best not to bore us in all of that, but I want to make sure that we really understand the totality of what the text is communicating. So that being said, let me pray for us, and then we'll, uh, we'll jump in. Father, thank you. Thank you so much for who you are. Thank you that uh, you love us, you, you care for us enough to give us your word. Uh, we are grateful in light of all that is going on in our nation that we have a kingdom that uh, has stood the test of time and will continue to stand the test of time. Jesus, you and you alone are who we hold to. We pray, God, that you would uh, guide us as we look at James chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. Holy Spirit, please grow us in our faith, uh, according to Romans 10, 17. Use it as a discerner of our innermost thoughts, according to Hebrews 4, 12. Spirit, please illuminate the text for us. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's jump in and get after this. We're going to spend a little bit of time on verse 12, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk about uh, the other verses afterwards. It says this, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which was uh, promised to those who love him. Now, the first thing I want to draw your attention to, where we got to spend a minute, is I want you to look at that word trial. What's that, like eight or nine words in? Blessed, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, all right? Um, I'm going to do something I've never done before, and I'm going to put the Greek up on the screen. Now, I know most of us do not speak Greek. I understand not everybody has an MDiv, but you can, even if you understand symbols, you're going to be able to see why this is important, okay? So I want to show you in Greek, James chapter 1, verse 2, and then I also want to show you verse 12, 13, and 14. And the reason I want you to see this is, is because I want you to look at the underlying portion in verse 2, okay? Okay. Now, I get it. You cannot see that. The first letter in the underlined portion of verse 2 is, it's actually the symbol of pi. It's where we get our, our letter P from. And then that actually, the uh, epsilon makes an E sound. Iota makes an I sound. That thing that looks like a P is actually an R and then an A. Okay, so you'd pronounce that para. And then you're going to notice if you speak, say, Spanish, in Greek, in the same way, there's always something called a case ending. Sometimes there's a, a prefix before that, but you always have the root of a word. The root of our word is para. Okay, now here's why this matters. Look at your translation in English in verse 2. Okay, that word para, that it's translated, is translated trial. You, you, uh, um, count it all joy when you go through various trials is what it says in verse 2. Now here we are in verse 12, and we have the same words. You can see it up there. It's the same word that's underlined. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Okay, great. I mean, there's, there's continuity there. But here's the problem. If you can, look at your English translations for verses 13 and 14. 
The same word appears, either with a prefix and a noun form or a verb form, appears in our translation in English, but this time it's translated as tempted. Not trial, but tempted. You can see it there. So look, one, two, three, four times in 13, and one time in 14. Now, the reason being is, if you speak another language, you're aware of this, sometimes it's difficult to come across a word because it might mean one thing, you're trying to you know, translate it, but this is even different than that. This is different than even what's called a homograph, which is a word like can. Can you do this? And I have a can of soup. We know we're different cans. That's even different than that. It's even different than having, uh, say, like something like a synonym. This is a unique uh, idea in a language where this word actually does mean the same thing, but depending on context is how it would be translated. So here is a, a strict definition of this word that we can see in something called the BDAG, B-D-A-G. It's the gold standard for Greek uh, uh, definitions. It says this, here's how you translate it. Either temptation or test, both senses can apply simultaneously depending on the context. The positive sense, test, and the negative sense, temptation, are functions of the context. So you could translate it trial, probation, testing, being tried, temptation, calamity, affliction, whatever it is, okay? Now, here's why I bring this up and why all of this matters and all this definition. I told you it's going to be technical, so I warned you on that, okay? But here's why all of this matters. I, I think verse 12 should be translated temptation. So when we read, blessed is the man who remains steadfast, under trial, I think a better translation is the word temptation. But here's what I want you to know. It's not that the ESV got it wrong. Think about this for a second. We're going to have to dissect this whole idea. When you're tempted, I'm talking to all the believers in the room right now. When you're tempted with something, actually, this applies to non-believers as well. Um, when you're tempted, what's in front of you is a kind of test, is it not? I mean, I, now who tests you? We're going to get into all of that in, in, in a second. But what's in front of you, you could, you know you shouldn't do that, and you could do it, or you know you shouldn't do that and you do do it. E either way, there's, a, there's these two options in front of you. In some ways, it's kind of a test. You can see how these words might blend together. And I, I think a better translation here is temptation, not just because of the context of uh, uh, tying itself, it's not quite the same as verse two, but also in the larger context of what we're looking at in verses 13 and 14. I think they translated tempts or uh, as being tempted in, that, uh, in, in verses 13 and 14 rightly, and I think we should also have done it in verse 12. Okay, so you're asking, who cares? That's all really cool. Why does that matter? Well, here's why it matters. What James is trying to accomplish is putting in front of us trials or testing or temptation or whatever that is. And as they're put in front of us, can I ask a question? Is it a sin to be tempted? The answer is no, right? Jesus was tempted. Is it a sin to go through a trial? Man, you receive cancer or, or a loss of job or whatever it is. Is it? A, well, no, no, it's not. But what James is trying to unpack rooted in both of these ideas is how do you respond to those things? In verse two, when you go through a trial, do you count it as joy? Here, and when you go through temptation, do you remain steadfast? That's what we're gonna try to unpack. So what is the proper response? Well, I just gave it to you. Look at the text again here in verse 12, okay? Verse 12 tells us, blessed is the, the, the man or the one, you could say brothers or sisters, but the man here is, is, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Now, steadfast, again, look at verse two. Now we're doing a lot of biblical work here. Verse two ties the same word that we just talked about, trials or temptation, also ties the word steadfast. In verse two, did it not say the testing of his faith produces steadfastness? You can also, if you're someone who marks in your Bible, you can write James chapter five verses 10 and 11, because it also talks about remaining steadfast. So what does it mean to remain steadfast? And this word was the most intriguing, even more than what I just put up there with the word trial in Greek, was the most intriguing in our passage, uh, to me at least, because I think of someone who's remaining steadfast as someone who's like, I don't know, receiving an onslaught of things, and it's like, hold on, right? Somebody like the way, what I picture somebody remaining steadfast is somebody's in a bunker in wartime and they're just like receiving fire, and you're kind of like, you could yell at them, just come on, you could do it, hang on, hang on. That's what I think of. The problem is, we got to get technical again. When I looked at the word in Greek, when I think of that, you are the passive agent. You're receiving fire and you're just remaining steadfast. The problem is st uh, steadfast in verse 12 is active. Now, what that means is to remain steadfast is not that you just, temptation's happening, come on, hang on, white knuckle, you could do it, you're almost there. That's not what it's saying. To be active and being steadfast is to do something. 
So if somebody's addicted to video games and they just cannot stop, it is not wrong to get rid of the console. That's what I tell guys addicted to pornography all the time, that to remove your smartphone should be a play here, should be on the table to be able to navigate this. To be active in your steadfastness is what James is trying to communicate here. So we are to remain steadfast. Now, what are the consequences, the positive consequences? If you and I, as a believer, remain steadfast under temptation, what happens? Well, we get our text. Our text tells us two things. One, we are blessed. You can see that in the beginning. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. Two, you can see it there, you receive the crown of life. So the first idea is blessed. I want you, if you can, you can write this in your Bible too, Psalm chapter one. Go, go to your, uh, in your mind to Psalm chapter one. What it says in Psalm chapter one is, blessed is the man who does not walk in the way of the wicked, nor stand in the, um, uh, the place of, uh, uh, of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, but whose delight is the law of the Lord. Now, you, what he's saying there in, in Psalm chapter one is, you are blessed if you don't navigate wickedness, but your delight is the law of the Lord. And this idea of bless, which is true here, is that there is a version of life that the Bible puts in front of you that is human flourishing, okay? And then there is not. And so when you are tempted, the two options that are in front of you that you're to remain steadfast, the world tells you, do it, it will feel good. But the Bible now is coming along and telling you, don't do it so you have a good life. Because human flourishing is found in this not hedonism and giving in to all the things that you want to, but a good life is found. And so you wonder, why do we have my grandparents who just, have, just had a good life? Did they go through things? Did they fail? Yes. But at the end of their life, there are these wise sages because they remain steadfast over and over and over. And you know what that produces? It produces a blessed life. And are there exceptions? Yes, but the rule is in God's uh, um, sovereignty. He has put in front of you a path that leads to human flourishing. And to uh, uh, remain steadfast in temptation is a path of human flourishing. The second benefit to all of this, the consequence of remaining steadfast, you can see it there, that when he has stood the test, which I actually think pertains to the end of your life, uh, but, but when he has stood the test, uh, he will receive, the, here it is, the crown of life. All right, let's get it, all right? Um, we don't quite know what to do with rewards sometimes, and I can't in totality explain when you die, how do we navigate rewards. Let me just show you some things that uh, in the New Testament that actually talk about other crowns that are mentioned. So you can find, for example, I think I have these on the screen as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, it mentions an imperishable crown. In uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19, there's a crown of rejoicing. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, there's a crown of righteousness. In 1 Peter chapter 4, or chapter 5, verse 4, there's a crown of glory. So here's these crowns mentioned. And then the crown of life that's mentioned here in James chapter 1 is also mentioned in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, the crown of life. And here's what I need you to do. I need you to remove like a European idea of crown because that's not like a crown on a king's head or a queen's head. That's not what, what's going on here. Uh, the type of crown that's being mentioned is the same type of crown that's mentioned by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And it's more of like a wreath, which is a, like a badge of honor, if you can think about it, okay? So, so sometimes, like, we fall down, we lay our crowns. It's like, I, I hope not that this song, actually, I don't even know how biblical that song is because I don't remember. It was from the 90s, so probably not that biblical. <laughs> um, but but when, we, when, we think of this, when we think of this song, right, like everything that we do, this honor, all that I've done, it does ultimately belong to Jesus. But we're not literally laying down crowns. That's not what this text is communicating. That's not what the uh, original readers would have understood. There's a sense of you have this badge of honor. Now, this is curious because let's say everyone on this side of the room endured temptation. You're all going to get the crown of life. And everyone on this side of the room, unfortunately, you did not. And you will not see, receive the crown of life. So now we all die. We all go into eternity forever. Is it not all of us looking to all of those over here and going, well, they got this badge of honor for all of eternity. Immediately, what comes to mind is three things at least. Number one, some kind of envy or jealousy. Number two, I thought Christ would be enough. Why do we need rewards? Or number three, um, in light of there being these crowns and, and, and all that, uh, does this negate some kind of grace or faith alone? I mean, those things immediately come to mind. And of course, Christ is enough. Of course, it is uh, in Christ alone and in faith alone. But at the same time, here it is. You've got to wrestle with what rewards mean. And there is good writing on this. I vehemently disagree with something called the free grace movement. I do not think it's biblical. But one thing that the free grace movement does do well is they talk about rewards that when you die. Now, 
Again, I can't define all of this, but what I can do is give you a resource, okay? So there's a writing that I read years ago and had to go back and look it up called The Portion of the Righteous. It's by Jonathan Edwards. He wrote it in 1740. Now, I personally find Jonathan Edwards insanely difficult to read, okay? But in this book, he navigates what might be going through your mind right now. How could half of this room, is it like Mormonism? There's levels of heaven? Like, how, how is this fair? Like, I, I don't get it. No. And, and, and the issue and what Edwards uh, tries to draw out is you're thinking through envy and, and uh, jealousy when that doesn't need to be the case. Listen to what he says. I'll just read a small portion. He has a ton of good writing in this book on it. He says, it will be no damp to the happiness of those who have lower degrees of happiness and glory, that there are others advanced in glory above them. For all shall be perfectly happy. Every one shall be perfectly satisfied. Every vessel that is cast into the ocean of happiness is full though there are some vessels far larger than others. Now, what he begins to unpack with this idea, and you can leave it up there, uh, leave that quote up there. What he begins to try to unpack with this idea is you're thinking through the lens of, imagine a cup and a five-gallon bucket fall into the ocean. It, are we worried about there being enough water in the ocean? No, we're not worried about it. And so this is God's vastness. And so you're thinking through envy in such a way that you're thinking it through the lens of sin. So let me give you examples of how you can actually imagine eternity that this half of the group received this, this uh, badge of honor and this half did not. I want you to think of two ways. Number one, selfishly. Uh, so what I mean by that is, think of it, uh, so this last Monday, myself and a group of guys, for the last three months, we've been preparing to do something called the MRF, which is you run a mile, you do 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups, 300 air squats, you run another mile, and you do it all with a 20-pound vest, okay? So we finally did the MRF for the fastest time that we could possibly get on Monday. Now, I did it in 43 minutes, which was by far the fastest I have ever done it before. And still, out of a group of about a dozen guys, I got second to last. But you know what? I don't care about them. I got 43 minutes, and the best time before that was like 48 minutes. We were flying, okay? So at a selfish level, what, what he wants to unpack is the first idea is you will just be so satisfied with who God is and what you've received that that's not a concern to you. You're not looking at someone going, well, they were a martyr and I wasn't, and so I, that's not what's going on there, okay? You will be satisfied with, with your time of 43 minutes, right? Which I'll get like 20 minutes in the Murph and, and the new heavens and the new earth, but so... <laughs> Okay, so, so, but the second idea is think of someone that you love desperately, okay? And, and this works really well for, for parents with their children. Uh, an example that I would give is my adopted brother um, paid off his house. And when he told me he paid off his house, I'm not kidding when I say this, there was not a glimpse of envy or jealousy. I almost came to tears with how happy I was for him. Now, do I still have a mortgage? Yes, okay? <laughs> But I just felt this sense of like gratitude towards the Lord. That is awesome, Kyle. I am so, up, like that is beautiful that you don't have to worry about this mortgage anymore. You paid off your house. That's amazing, right? Parents for your kids, there's a sense of you want them to even thrive beyond you. Though I will never let my boys beat me in basketball, that's never going to happen. If by chance one day I become paralyzed, then they do, okay? When that takes place... I'm promise, I will be grateful. I want them to be better than I am in this spot. I want them to be better in life, a, a, a better follower of Jesus. I want more for them. And that sense of love, what Edwards wants to unpack is this idea of it's not just selfish that you're fulfilled, but you will look at them and go, I'm even more satisfied that you receive this crown. I find even more joy than I thought I had in your rejoicing. That's what's going on here. So that may be too much to unpack, but the idea is when you endure or you remain steadfast in temptation, you will receive this blessing, this crown of life, which is given to those who love him, which uh, honestly, chapter two, verse five says the same thing in regards to the poor. Um, but let's go to verse 13. <clears throat> verse 13, 14, and 15 are gonna change gears a little bit, and this is what James is gonna do. Hey, on the note of temptation, can we talk about that for a second? And so in verse 13, we're going to talk about temptation. Let me first tell you what is not true in verse 13. Let me tell you, you might be thinking this, this is not true. And then in verses 14 and 15, let me tell you what is true. Here is what is not true in verses 13. In verse 13, <clears throat> let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. So in that moment when you're tempted and you're trying to remain steadfast, two things should not happen. Number one, you can't say, um, yeah, this is like God. God is tempted. Now, immediately your first knee-jerk reaction might be to go, well, obviously God is perfectly satisfied and all that. But I will say old atheism would always argue, well, if Jesus was fully God, how was he himself tempted? 
I'm not going to get into that. I'll just, I'll, I'll say this just very briefly. Um, and maybe we don't stress this enough in evangelicalism, but there is a unique moment in the incarnation when Jesus was here on earth that is different than any other time in history. Uh, Jesus, before and after the incarnation, was never hungry, was never thirsty, was never tired, but he was all of those things when he was here on the earth. He is fully God and he is fully man. That is true. And so there's a sense of the incarnation existing. Jesus is still fully God and, and there's a mysteriousness that goes on uh, there. But we understand from this that we can say in the totality of looking at who God is, there's nothing that you can tempt God with. Hey, God, do you want this? Because he's fully sat. He has the very thing, like everything that you could ever imagine. He is. He is. I'm going to tr fall short with words, right? But, but that's the idea. The second part is a little more difficult because it says this, uh, uh, for God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. Now, this is why we had to spend a few minutes on the word tempt because what we do know from Hebrews 10, John chapter 6, and 1 Peter 4 is God does, the other way we could translate this word, he does test people. We, we see that. He does test them. And so we, now James is making a delineation with this word, and he's helping us understand a little bit more, but he doesn't tempt them. And so what James wants to unpack with this idea, because now you might go, well, then fine, in God's sovereignty, how does he, we'll get there in a second. But what he does want to unpack is this idea that you can't, like you do in trials, or let me just speak for myself, when something bad happens to me or my family, you know who I'm super mad at at first? God. He has the power to stop it. He doesn't. He's all sovereign, all power. Immediately, I go to blaming God. Well, what James wants to say, in the same thing you do with trials, you have a tendency to blame your sin on someone or something else. Sometimes it could be God. Actually, MacArthur addresses this. He says, James clearly has no patience with a foolish fatalism by which a poor man blames his poverty for turning him into a thief and therefore uh, justifying his stealing or by which a drunk blames business or domestic problems and pressures for having him drink and therefore to recklessly drive, uh, to do reckless driving that seriously injures or kills someone. Nor does he allow for the notion that the devil made me do it. Even more vehemently, G uh, James opposes the intolerable idea of blaming God. Okay, that, that's what's being impacted. Those are, that is not true. Well, then we can ask, well, then what is going on in temptation? Fortunately, we have verses 14 and 15. Who's behind it? What's, what's taking place? Here it is. But, so that's not true, but here is what is true. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when, he is, uh, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Now, before we unpack this, let me just tell you, we were just given the formula of sin and death. That what we just read right now is the formula for sin and death. It starts with this idea that a person has a desire. And, and hum, you know, humankind, of course, because we never sin, we either have good desires or desires that are justified to be good, right? Because of course we would never have a bad desire. We'd never have an e evil desire. So when you punch someone in the face, it's because either they deserved it or you couldn't control yourself. It's a justified, you did a good thing there. When you sleep with someone else, it's because she's withholding sex in the marriage and therefore you're justified to sleep with someone else. So there's always a justified reason, a justified motivation, a justified desire as to why you're doing. We see this in the area of abortion. We see in the area of homosexuality. We see this in all areas in our culture and sin. There is a reason that you can do this, of course, because you would never have an evil desire. Well, the reality is, all these desires are rooted, I think, or most are rooted in a good thing. The desire to sleep with someone or have sex is because you are made to be able to do that. But God has given a confines in which that is to take place. So what James is addressing is this good thing that you have now turned evil, this bad desire. So when, I, when, I, uh, when we read this enticed by his own desire, it's not referring to a good desire here. So that's where it starts. So it starts with that idea, that idea. Now here's what happens, uh, the formula that, that is laid out. First, with this bad desire, we're enticed. That word enticed in Greek literally means to put a bait on a hook. It's the same word there, okay? So let's ask this question. What's the bait that's on the hook? Well, in the context here, the bait that's on the hook is your own desire. So now you have a desire to do something, the, the hook has been baited. Now the next step of this is you are, quote, lured away. You're lured away or drawn away. It's the same word that's used in uh, John chapter 6 when uh, uh, Jesus says that the Father draws people unto himself. That's the same word that is used there, right? So you are, you're lured away, and, and, and uh, yeah, that leads us to the, the next point, which is, so what's next here? The desire is conceived, which speaks to just life. Now, the, this, this sin, if you ever want to read a crazy chapter, read Romans chapter 6 and see how uh, Paul tends to talk about sin as if it's a living organism. 
that can almost like take you over like a person, right? And so we understand that what's being, now that desire, which you have chosen to go after, you're drawn away to it. You're drawn away, uh, uh, moving towards it, away from what God would say. Here the temptation is, and when this is taking place, now conception takes place. This is a part of the reason, one of the many other scriptures that we believe life begins at conception. Life to that sin is now in real time. Well, what happens is this desire is conceived. It gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So let's get real uh, anthropological. I don't think that's a word. I just made it up. But let's get real that, okay? Here's what happens. Here's what I think is, is going to take place. I'm going to take you to a time in my life when uh, my wife and I, so today we celebrate 18 years, but we were together five years before that. We were high school sweethearts. And we just had become believers, but we were also teenagers. And so we were still navigating our relationship with the Lord, and we were sinning sexually. So here's how this would go. We'd go on a date, or we'd hang out, or whatever it is, or I'd... I was a jerk and I'd probably play video games and she just sat there. I don't want to get into it, okay? Um, <laughs> but regardless of what, what, what happened was, uh, eventually there'd be this moment where I would want to have, uh, do some kind of sexual act with, with Candace, okay? And I would make that decision and then I'd begin to pursue it. And upon pursuing it, because she's always been the stronger one and always the more faithful one, she would no, 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 but I'm a pretty persuasive guy, romantic, okay? And I would, I would, I would talk her into it. And then we would perform said act, okay? That's, that's how that order would go. Now, here's the tricky part in understanding the order of what I just explained. There would be times where we would be out and I would decide I'm going to pursue Candace and I want to do some kind of sexual act. And in that, in, 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 in moving in that direction, either she would remain steadfast and we wouldn't do it, or one of my homies would know where we are, would le legit roll up and stop us from doing it, or something in life would just stop us from doing that, and we wouldn't actually do the sexual act. But even when we didn't do the sexual act, when I went home that night, I still felt convicted. You want to know why I still felt convicted? But because regardless of what took place, I already made the decision to sin. And so what James chapter 1 is unpacking for us here is making this decision has, has given life to that. I'm moving. So sin is conceived here, and then it's going to be born. Now, the birth of that sin is the action. But man, whether we did it or not, I already went to the Lord and said, I don't care what you have to say in this moment. I want to do me. And so that's sinful. And so James is unpacking all of this, and it all starts back with what you want, what you believe is right, which is clearly opposite to human flourishing. Now, here's what I will say. What that road leads to is death. It leads to death. Now, whether that's literal or figurative, I can't definitively speak on, but I will say my argument would be it's both. Meaning, literally, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 12, all men die because of sin. That's true. So literally, we, we experience death as a humankind because sin is in the world. But the other side is, figuratively, I think this also uh, is a leading to death. Like I mentioned Romans 6, it talks about you becoming a slave to sin. Slavery is a version of a removal of self-autonomy. There's a death involved in that. You do not get to live the life that you want to live. And, and maybe you in this room have experienced that, or maybe you know someone who's experienced that, that you look at their life, and they've been addicted to something for years, and you look at them and you, and you go, you're a slave to that. There, there is a death that is eroding your soul in that. You can see it. And so whether literal or figurative, James is warning us, that's where we're going. If you go down that path, that's where you're going. Now, that being said, we get verses 16, 17, and 18, which I will also revisit next week to unpack uh, part of my role at Pella is to lay out the preaching calendar, and James was insanely difficult. I have no one to blame but myself in, in putting 16, 17, and 18 with this passage, but it's really difficult to how to navigate where to go with what. And so I want to read, I think 16 and 17 clearly go with the passage that we're, we're talking about, but I think 18 kind of does, but also kind of goes with the section next week. But this is what it says. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and every perfect uh, gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's uh, no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now, the first part there I want you to see is every good and perfect gift, it's coming down from God. So in light of what you may blame God for your temptation, I think James is responding, don't be deceived about this. God brings good gifts. Now you may go, it doesn't feel like he always brings good gift. And I would say, Job tells us, even if he slays us, we will still worship. In light of who God is, we will spend uh, um, uh, a moment in eternity and we'll go, oh, I see. I see what's going on. He brings good gifts. But there's this adjectival statement that's described to God that this good gift, it comes down from the father of lights when there's no variation or shadow of turning. 
And we understand all that we understand in this world when it comes to light through variations of shadows. I'm not going to get into all, all of that right now, but I have a hammock in my yard right now, and I can lay in that hammock maybe three hours of the day because it's under a tree, and if I choose to lay in that hammock any other part of the day, I will literally be burned alive, okay? Because I want to be under a shadow. Now, imagine if the sun was a person. Try to describe a shadow to the sun. How can you begin to describe the shadow? You can't, right? But everything we know, so though shadows change, the sun doesn't. And James is bringing this idea up, and it's a theological term, a $1,000 word, called the immutability of God, that God is unchanging. And so his standards are not going to change. You can try to justify all you want while you're allowed to do that thing. It doesn't change the sun. No matter what shadow you want to be under, the reality is God is who he is. And he's always been that way. He'll always be that way. And so he has this standard, which I think helps us understand a little bit in verse 18 when it says, and of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. I think first fruits of his creatures is not referring to Genesis 1. I think it's uh, 1 Corinthians 15 that we as believers are the first fruits of the resurrection, that now we live out a life that is not the same life that we used to live out. And so we, we live out now what God will do in, uh, uh, one day with all things, restore all things back to themselves. But we'll come back to that next week. Before I leave us, though, I, I think it's important for us to walk away with this text, not just with a technical understanding, but now we got to ask this big question. Okay, cool. I got knowledge, but I ain't here for knowledge. I'm here because I love the Lord and I want to be more like him. So, so what do I do with this? And I think there are two things that we can do with this. The first one is this. Christians, and again, I'm not trying to ostracize someone who's not a Christian, but Christians, we have spent so much time trying not to lose. We have forgotten that we're trying to win, meaning we, we are so consumed by not sinning that when we read a verse like uh, James chapter 1, verse 12, we forget that it's not just about not sinning. Psalm 51 is very true. Feeling convicted is very real. When you sin, you feel that. And I would even say the Holy Spirit is doing that. That's a good thing. But you've also forgotten that if you succeed or remain steadfast in this temptation, it's not that you just don't lose. It's that there are rewards that await. That when it's all said and done, you're not just going to stand in eternity and go, man, I'm glad I didn't fail. There's a sense of by the power of Christ, and again, Romans chapter 6, you're going to be grateful that you succeeded, that you found victory in that. He's not just giving you something to go, you might be able to do it. There are so many believers in this room that with the thing that you're struggling with, they have found victory in because of the power of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. And so the idea is that's put in front of you, stop like living as if I'm just trying not to lose and be defeated by sin, which under the glorifying our, our, our bodies, uh, trying to glorify uh, the Lord with, with our bodies, that's true. But the other side is true as well. And, and James wants to emphasize that in verse 12. And then the last thing, and maybe the most important thing is, all the benefits that I just mentioned are only true because the man, Jesus Christ, had a nature like ours, according to Philippians 2 and Hebrews chapter 2. And he went into temptation and he obeyed, according to Luke chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 4. Because he succeeded, he now gives us victory. And this is a trip because I said this from the jump when we went through James. There is a tendency, a temptation, that you can walk away from reading James and feel works-based salvation. I cannot express to you enough, in light of what Jesus has done, you got to believe this. You did nothing to earn your salvation. And so when you sin and you feel like God doesn't love you anymore, you can do nothing to lose it. The grace of God is bigger than your sin. My man, breathe. Go to war against the things that are waging war against your soul, according to 1 Peter. But, but, but Jesus walks alongside us, reminding us of what is true in him being successful in him ultimately finding victory. Can I finish with this? In Hebrews chapter four, which I think a lot of us are, might be familiar with, it says this, the first part. I don't know if we're as familiar as, as uh, verse 16, but we're familiar with verses 15 or 14 and 15. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has uh, ascended into heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to, uh, to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way. There it is. He's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So think about it like this. It's not that Jesus is just uh, gives us substitutionary atonement. That's true. It's not that Jesus is just our example, but what Hebrews is telling us is in that moment when you're trying to be lured away or your own desires are trying to lure you away, he's literally walking alongside you. No, 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 don't. 
No, no, no. I know. I know what it's like. I know what it's like. He, he's, I don't know, we'll use the language through the power of the Holy Spirit, coaching you along. But the language here isn't a coach, it's a priest. The idea that he cares deeply about you. And I think this is important because verse 16 is, in light of that, we don't know as well. It says this, let us then, because that's true, because he empathizes, he knows what it's like to experience temptation, the very temptation you'll experience tonight. You're going to experience it tonight. That very temptation, he knows what it's like, that being true. This is what he says, let us then, because he found victory, approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our times of need. Isn't that curious? That it is his mercy and grace that helps us in those times of needs. And this flips man-made religion and, and, and humanistic Christianity on its head because what motivates us goes all the way back to James 1.1, 1, 1, love. Jesus, you saved me, and because you saved me, I want to respond. I want to be more like you. I want to know you. I want to remain steadfast. Now, I feel almost, um, I don't know if the word's convicted or uh, forced to quote Spurgeon now because everyone seems to think that's the only person I read. So let me read a quote from Charles Spurgeon to finish our time together. It says this, that great head of mankind has suffered from the very temptation which is now pestering you. He knows all about the case of each one of us and he knows how to deal with it and how to bear us up and bear us through. So you see, dear friends, there is no temptation happening to you not having been endured and vanquished by your blessed representative, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Come, my hearers, let Jesus be your master and your Lord. Come, you runaways, return to him. Come, you castaways, hope in him. Be his, for he has made himself yours. Seek him, for he has sought you. Obey him, for he has obeyed for you. He bends to us with eternal salvation in his hand. Believe in him and live. God grant it. Let's pray. Thank you.